Hi, I'm Josh, and I'm so grateful that you've decided to join me for some fascinating Napoleonic history today as I look at the book Waterloo Voices, 1815, The Battle at First Hand by Martin Beardsley. This is a collection of contemporary chronicles from soldiers and other people who were there at the Battle of Waterloo and who subsequently gave their account of their experiences on that day. I'm endlessly fascinated with contemporary chronicles. I have other books on my history shelf behind me here that go all the way back to the Middle Ages. I have the Contemporary Chronicles of the Hundred Years' War by Jean Froissart, Jean Lebel, and Angerin de Monstrelet. And it fascinates me so much that we can go all the way back to the Middle Ages and get first-hand accounts from people who participated in the conflicts and the events of the era. So I'm really excited to dive into Waterloo Voices 1815. Waterloo obviously represents the end of Napoleon Bonaparte, a man whom historians just can't seem to get enough of. And it always seems a little strange to me that historians and others who are just interested in history just fall over themselves in praise for Napoleon, for Alexander the Great, Julius Caesar, when in fact, these men were all sort of the Hitlers of their day. They were men whose ambition and desire for power drove them to go out into the world and take what wasn't theirs to cause hundreds of thousands to millions of deaths as they fought wars and expanded their own wealth and empire and caused so much human suffering and yet we praise these people because they were undoubtedly brilliant military tacticians. So yeah, by this point, Napoleon had spent at least a decade causing absolute mayhem in Europe. If you want to hear the whole background of the Napoleonic Wars, I really highly recommend checking out a video series called The Napoleonic Wars Oversimplified Parts 1 and 2 by a channel called Oversimplified. It'll take you an hour to watch both videos, but they pre present such an amazing overview of the Napoleonic history leading up to the Battle of Waterloo and beyond it. They also dive into why Napoleon was such a brilliant military tactician as well. So if you have a chance, check out those two videos. They give such a really great overview of Napoleonic history. And in the meantime, we get a couple of people at both at the beginning and at the end of this book who talk about the fact that Europe was weary of war and the fact that so many had suffered at the hands of the ambition of one man. So the first quote is here. An English soldier talks about being called up to go back to Europe for more fighting and he says my departure from England was very sudden after having been so long absent in Holland Sicily Spain and France I thought Europe was weary of war and that I was safe and comfortably situated with my family at home yet amidst all the sufferings of my mind in parting from my friends I felt it my duty to go in search of that enemy of peace the tyrant of the world and if it were required to die for the cause for I was fully sensible we were defending truth and justice in the immediate aftermath of the Battle of Waterloo, this particular British soldier shares a flask with a wounded French soldier, and he says, I could not help remarking how many thousand had suffered for the ambition of one man. The French soldier returned me with a flask, and looking with a savage pride on the dead bodies that lay in heaps around him, he cried as strong as his weakness would allow him, Vive Napoleon! La gloire de la France! Such an instance will give you a strong idea of the infatuation of these people. As for this great battle itself, one of the most important battles in European history, there are a couple of summaries by soldiers who were there that kind of made me chuckle. Here is one British officer's entire summary of this great battle. The battle was very bloody, but we compelled the enemy to retreat. That about sums it up. Another of my favorite summaries comes from another soldier. One British soldier in meeting another British soldier says, Meeting one next morning, a very little fellow, I asked what had happened to them yesterday. I'll be hanged, says he, if I know anything at all about the matter, for I was all day trodden in the mud and galloped over by every scoundrel who had a horse, and, in short, that I only owe my existence to my insignificance. So there you go, this fellow participates in the Great Battle of Waterloo, and all he can remember is trying not to be run over by the cavalry the whole day.
Now this battle took place in Belgium and some of these accounts come from civilians who were very nearby to the battle and throughout the course of the day were getting various rumors from people who were passing through town essentially and the rumors were just absolutely outrageous. One person would run through the town saying the British have been defeated, the French are coming, flee for your lives, and then the next person would come say the British have taken the day, it is victory, and it was one extreme rumor after another for these poor civilians who were anxiously waiting to hear the results. So at one point we have a group of them crowded together and Charlotte Eaton, a travel writer, says this, At the bottom of the staircase, a group of affrighted Belgians were assembled, all crowding and talking together with Belgic volubility. They cried out that news had arrived of the battle having terminated in the defeat of the British, that all the artillery and baggage of the army were retreating, and that a party of Belgians had just entered the town, bringing intelligence that a large body of French had been seen advancing through the woods to take Brussels, and that they were only two leagues off. I just liked the term Belgic volubility. You Belgians, are you known for being loud? <laughs> but as for what was taking place on the battlefield itself, that was what most of this book was about. And for many of the soldiers, the day seemed to start and end with liquor. <laughs> it was surprising to me how many of them were just doing shots of booze throughout the day just to keep themselves going. One Scottish soldier from a Glaswegian regiment says, Two hours after daybreak, we got half an allowance of liquor, which was the most welcome thing I ever received. <laughs> it's a good way to start your day. Another German soldier started the day in a similar fashion. He says, About 10 o'clock, the order came to clean out the muskets and fresh load them. Half an allowance of rum was then issued, and we descended into the plain and took our positions in solid squares. Another British soldier in the thick of the battle describes this. Our poor old captain was horribly frightened and several times came to me for a drop of something to keep his spirits up. And then of course what better thing than booze when you're wounded. A British soldier describes this encounter with another wounded soldier. He says, I saw that he was wounded and recollecting that a canteen of beer was at my back, I handed it to him and desired him to quench his thirst without scruple. The poor fellow drank, thanked me heartily, told me that almost all his regiment, the 28th, were destroyed, and then, lifting himself from my horse, on which he had been leaning, tottered towards the rear. I watched him and saw that he had not gone 12 yards when he fell. Almost immediately afterwards, his limbs gave a convulsive stretch and he was a corpse. Guess you might as well die with the taste of beer on your lips. There's worse ways to go, I suppose. <laughs> now, it could definitely be overdone as well, as happened to this particular British soldier. A sergeant describes the situation saying, It was some time before I got our allowance of Hollands, and we had scarcely received it when a cannon shot went through the cask, and man too. While waiting there, Shaw, the fighting man of the lifeguards, was pointed out to me, and we little thought then that he was about to acquire such celebrity. He drank a considerable portion of the raw spirit, and under its influence probably, he soon afterwards left his regiment, and running amuck at the enemy, was cut down by them as a madman. So this this guy didn't want the liquor to go to waste, so he drank up a whole bunch of it and charged madly at the enemy and was subsequently killed. So I guess a little bit of courage is good. Too much courage, not so much. Now leaving aside the booze, what struck me was just how deadly a battle, the Battle of Waterloo was. Just what a large percentage of the participants were either killed or wounded in the combat and just how crazy dangerous it was to be on that battlefield. That's best described in this manner here by a captain of horse artillery. We were enveloped in thick smoke and despite the incessant roar of cannon and musketry could distinctly hear around us a mysterious humming noise like that which one hears of a summer's evening proceeding from myriads of black beetles. Cannon shot too plowed the ground in all directions and so thick was the hail of balls and bullets that it seems dangerous to extend one's arm lest it should be torn off. In spite of the serious situation in which we were, I could not help being somewhat amused at the astonishment expressed by our kind-hearted surgeon, Hitchens, who heard for the first time this sort of informal carillon about his ears, began staring around in the wildest and most comic manner, exclaiming, My God, Mercer, what is that? What is all that noise? How curious, how very curious! And then, when a cannon shot rushed hissing past, There, there, what is it all? It's just mind-blowing to think that 
just the buzzing of musket balls and the hissing of cannonballs flying within feet or even inches of your face the whole time. What a wild situation that is. And yet we have this other very relaxed fellow. There were times when the infantry weren't engaged with the enemy when they were told to lie down on the ground to avoid all these projectiles that were flying through the air. And this fellow says, as the enemy's artillery was taking off a great many of our men, we were ordered to lie down to avoid the shots as much as possible. And I took advantage of this circumstance to obtain an hour's sleep as comfortably as ever I did in my life. Though there were at that time upwards of 300 cannon in full play. <laughs> So this guy just takes an hour long nap in the middle of the Battle of Waterloo while musket balls and cannon shot are going over his head. One theme that was repeated a bit in the book was the fact that the British soldiers were so impressed by a French unit of cavalry called the cuirassiers. Now the French cuirassiers were called that because they wore these cuirasses or breastplates as well as helmets and so they were heavily armored at a time when armor had really kind of gone out of fashion. And so these cuirassiers were kind of the Napoleonic equivalent of the Knights of the Middle Ages, these big, heavily armored, skillful soldiers who definitely struck fear into the British and their allies. Here are a couple of detailed descriptions of the cuirassiers that I found to be interesting. One comes from a fellow who edited a book called The Battle of Waterloo, and he says, The cuirassiers of the French Imperial Guard are all arrayed in armor. The front cuirass is in the form of a pigeon's breast, so as to effectually turn off a musket shot, unless fired very near, owing to its brightness. The back cuirass is made to fit the back. They weigh from 9 to 11 pounds each, according to the size of the man, and are stuffed inside with a pad. They fit on by a kind of fish-scaled clasp, and are put off and on in an instant. They have helmet, the same as our horse guards, and straight long swords and pistols, but no carbines. All the accounts agree in the great advantage that the French cuirassiers derived from their armor. Their swords were three inches longer than any used by the Allies, and in close action the cuts of our sabers did no execution, except they fortunately came across the end of the enemy. The latter, also feeling themselves secure in their armor, advanced deliberately and steadily until they came within about 20 yards of our ranks, as a musket ball could not penetrate the cuirasses at a greater distance. The cuirass, however, was attended with one disadvantage. The wearer, in close action, cannot use his arm with perfect facility in all directions. He chiefly thrusts, but cannot cut with ease. They are all chosen men, must be above six feet high, have served in three campaigns, twelve years in the service, and of a good character. And and if there is a good horse to be found, they have them. It is to be observed that a wound through a cuirass mostly proves mortal. So not only were they heavily armored, but they were chosen men who had a lot of military experience. They were also chosen apparently for their height. They s said that they were all at least six feet tall, which for that time was astonishingly tall. I looked it up and apparently the average height of a man during the Napoleonic era was about five foot five. Um, interestingly enough, Napoleon himself was five foot six, so he was in fact a little taller than the average, despite the British propaganda that mostly succeeded successfully made him out to be this tiny little tyrant. But yeah, in an age when five foot five was the average, to have these guys who were six feet or taller on horseback, fully armored, would have been an incredibly imposing sight. Here's another description. A considerable number of the French cuirassiers made their appearance on the rising ground just in our front, took the artillery we had placed there, and came at a gallop down upon us. Their intrepid bearing was well calculated, in an enemy, to inspire a feeling of dread. None of them under six feet, defended by steel helmets and corslets, made pigeon-breasted to throw off the balls. Thus armed and accoutred, they looked so truly formidable that I thought we could not have the slightest chance with them. They came up rapidly until within about 10 or 12 paces of the square when our rear ranks poured into them a well-directed fire which put them into confusion and they retired. The two front ranks, kneeling, then discharged their pieces at them. Some of the cuirassiers fell wounded and several were killed. Those dismounted by the death of their horses immediately unclasped their armor to facilitate their escape. Now when they described squares, they're describing formations of infantry. So when the infantry were generally fighting, they were in line 
I guess all next to each other to pour the most maximum amount of firepower into the enemy. However, they were vulnerable to cavalry charges, so when the cavalry charged, they would take that line and they would form up a square formation with their bayoneted muskets pointing on the outside of the square so that the cavalry in order to do any damage had to somehow penetrate past their bayonets and get into the square and then cause damage. What I discovered from reading this book was that the British squares were very effective against the cavalry charges of the French that over and over throughout the battle the French charged with the cavalry but the squares held together and as men were cut down they, they formed the square smaller and smaller but they kept their formation and they didn't run away and so they thus nullified the strength of these cavalry cavalry charges. Here are a couple of descriptions of what it was like to face the charge of the cuirassiers. This one comes from a German ally. A black consolidated body was soon seen approaching and we distinguished by sudden flashes of light from the sun's rays the iron cased cavalry of the enemy. Shouts of stand fast were heard from the little squares around and very quickly these gigantic fellows were upon us. No words can convey the sensation we felt on seeing these heavy armed bodies advancing at full gallop against us, flourishing their sabers in the air, striking their armor with the handles, the sun gleaming on the steel, the long horsehair disheveled by the wind bore an appearance confounding the senses to an astonishing disorder, but we dashed them back as coolly as the sturdy rock repels the ocean's foam. The sharp-toothed bayonet bit many an adventurous fool, and on all sides we presented our bristly points like the peevish porcupines assailed by clamorous dogs. The horse guards then came up and drove them back. And here's another description from a British soldier. As soon as they quickened their trot to a gallop, the cuirassiers bent their heads so that the peaks of their helmets looked like visors, and they seemed cased in armor from the plume to the saddle. Not a shot was fired till they were within thirty yards when the word was given. The effect was magical. Through the smoke we could see helmets falling, cavaliers starting from their seats with convulsive springs as they received our balls, horses plunging and rearing in the agonies of fright and pain, and crowds of the soldiery dismounted, part of their squadron in retreat, but the more daring remainder backing their horses to force them on our bayonets. Our fire soon disposed of these gentlemen. The main body reformed in our front, were reinforced, and rapidly and gallantly repeated their attacks. In fact, from this time, about four o'clock, till near six, we had a constant repetition of these brave but unavailing charges. The best cavalry is contentable to a steady and well-supplied infantry regiment. Even our men saw this and began to pity the useless perseverance of these assailants, and as they advanced would grab all out. Here come those damned fools again. So we can see that despite the fearsome strength and skill of the cavalry, the cuirassiers, the British squares held firm and were able to continually repel them. And before I continue to talk about Waterloo Voices 1815, I want to let you know that this video is brought to you by my Patreon supporters. In particular, I want to thank my higher tier supporters, Joanna, Paul, and Mojo Dam. Your generosity really means the world to me. And it definitely helps me keep going at a time when things are pretty tough for me in my life. So thanks so much to my patrons. I really appreciate your support. Now back to the book. Now it's interesting to see how combat played out in this era with a mixture of gallantry and honor that is reminiscent of the Middle Ages as well as truly cowardly actions that were more from that kind of Napoleonic era, I suppose. We have this account from the midst of the battle by a British soldier who says, One poor wounded Frenchman was thrown from his horse, and a comrade nobly returned and offered the soldier the help of his stirrup. An active light infantryman of the 14th, Whitney by name, who had shot one cuirassier, having reloaded, was about to fire at the mounted Frenchman, who was then rescuing his comrade, when Goddard interfered and said, No, Whitney, don't fire. Let him off. He is a noble fellow. So in that manner, the British soldiers decided to reward the courage of this other French cavalryman who had come back to help his wounded companion. Similarly, we have this account from a British cavalry soldier. And it says, Colonel Harvey of the 14th was in a charge of the light cavalry when he found himself opposed to a French officer who was proceeding to make a cut at him when, perceiving the colonel had but one arm, he dropped his sword, exclaiming he would never use his sword against a man thus situated. In this instance also, the gallant colonel has been unable to find his noble opponent to thank him after the battle. So, I guess he noticed that his opponent 
was missing an arm. He must have previously lost an arm in a past battle, and so his opponent refused to f fight him, saying, I'm not going to fight a one-armed man. It just doesn't seem fair, I suppose. But it wasn't all chivalry. We have this account from another British soldier who says, I must name to you an individual occurrence which happened in our regiment. Sergeant Taylor, on coming up with the cuirassiers, made a cut at the head of one of them, which had no other effect on the Frenchman than to induce him to cry out in derision, ha ha, and to return a severe blow at the sergeant, which was admirably parried. And Taylor then thrust his saber into the mouth of the cuirassier, who instantly fell, and the conqueror cried, ha ha, in his turn, which circumstance much increased the ardor of the other men. <laughs> so, I guess don't be so fast to say ha ha when an enemy misses you, because your next thrust might be into your mouth. Ugh. And on the really cowardly end of the scale there, there are a lot of accounts throughout the book of men who were wounded lying on the battlefield who as enemy soldiers went past them to go from one area of the battlefield to another would just sort of stab at the enemy wounded who were laying on the ground and whether they had a lance or a sword they just kind of hack at them on the way by and this was one problem faced by the wounded the other major problem was there was a massive amount of looting that was happening whether it was enemy soldiers who would go through the pockets of wounded or killed enemies just to find whatever valuables they could or it also describes a group of civilians who followed the army for the sole purpose of in the middle of the battle running out onto the battlefield to down soldiers to loot their valuables to go through their pockets and, and find whatever they could and as the battle was raging around them, the musket balls and cannonballs were flying around their heads. They were out on the field just to see what they could loot from the soldiers who were participating in the battle, which is a, such a horrible thing. But we have this description of, of a civilian who was participating in that activity. One soldier says, I saw one woman of Gotterville cut off the fingers of a Prussian officer who was sorely hurt but still living to secure the jeweled rings that he wore. So this lady cut off the fingers of a still alive soldier to take his rings. The wounded were just in a terrible position back in those days. We hear about the wounded on the battlefield literally being out on the field for a couple of days after the battle. Those who could not crawl off and make their own way to a nearby town for help were just left on the battlefield until people could have mercy on them and come and, and pick them up and maybe try to throw them in a cart and take them to get some help in a nearby town. But yeah for a day a couple of days they're just lying there out on the field one poor fellow had this terrible indignity he had been severely wounded in both arms and it said he recovered but was never afterwards able to feed himself or put on his hat <laughs> and if you know the role of hats in the 19th century you know what a terrible thing it is to not be able to put on a hat obviously as important as being able to feed yourself <laughs> so now I talked about the French cuirassiers. Here's a little bit about the British army. Now, we have this description of the British cavalry. In contrast to the French, they were described this way. These cavalry, selected for their tried gallantry and skill, not their height or mustachios, who were the terror of Northern Europe and had never yet been foiled, were first brought up by the 3rd Battalion of the 1st Regiment. So they made a specific note that these men were not chosen for how tall they were or for their glorious mustachios, which was a thing. They cavalry uh, of certain regiments were expected to keep mustachios as part of the overall uniform. I guess the British weren't as much into that. We also see some of the calm, reserved British demeanor here. The leader of the British and Allied army during the Battle of Waterloo was the Duke of Wellington and one of his staff members, Lord Uxbridge, was with him when um, they received some cannon fire and Lord Uxbridge says by God sir I've lost my leg to which Wellington replied by God sir so you have <laughs> and that was the end of that conversation here's another British soldier who after the battle was having his army amputated and there's a whole section towards the end of the book about medical treatment which I found fascinating and 
Even with my 16 years of paramedic experience, I did find some of the descriptions to be rather stomach turning of just what these poor wounded fellows had to go through and just how long it took for them to die of their wounds and infection and that sort of thing. One British soldier says, I remained in Brussels three days and had ample means here, as in several other places, such as Salamanca, etc., for witnessing the cutting off of arms and legs. The French I have ever found to be brave, yet I cannot say they will undergo a surgical operation with the cool, unflinching spirit of a British soldier. An incident which here came under my notice may in some measure show the difference of the two nations. An English soldier belonging to, if I recollect rightly, the first Royal Dragoons, evidently an old weather-beaten war Warfarer, while undergoing the amputation of an arm below the elbow, held the injured limb with his other hand without betraying the slightest emotion, save occasionally helping out his pain by spitting forth the proceeds of a large plug of tobacco, which he chewed most unmercifully while under the operation. Near to him was a Frenchman, bellowing lustily while a surgeon was probing for a ball near the shoulder. This seemed to annoy the Englishman more than anything else, and so much so, that as soon as his arm was amputated, he struck the Frenchman a smart blow across the cheek with the severed limb, holding it at the hand wrist, saying, Here, take that, and stuff it down your throat, and stop your damned bellowing. <laughs> so, this British soldier slaps the Frenchman in the, in the face with his freshly severed arm and tells him to stop his whining. So, mind you, the British weren't the only ones to show themselves to be cool under pretty extreme circumstances. In fact, we have this account that talks about a French infantry charge that was repulsed and the French were forced to retreat again. And this British soldier says, When the French saw us rushing through the hedge and heard the tremendous huzzah which we gave, they turned. But instead of running, they walked off in close columns with the greatest steadiness and allowed themselves to be butchered without any material resistance. So, rather than look like cowards and run away pell-mell in, in disorder, they decided just to walk off in ordered columns, but in the process allowed themselves to be cut to pieces. So at what point are you going to say enough of the bravado? Let's get back to safety. So those are just some little snippets from the battle itself. Right near the end we also get some descriptions of Napoleon which I found to be interesting. We have this as a second-hand account of somebody who was with Napoleon during, throughout the Battle of Waterloo, I guess. And Charlotte Eaton, the travel writer, is describing this person's account. He said that Bonaparte issued his orders with great vehemence and even impatience. He took snuff incessantly, but in a hurried manner and apparently from habit and without being conscious that he was doing so. He talked a great deal and very rapidly. His manner of speaking was abrupt, quick, and hurried. He was extremely nervous and agitated at times, though his anticipations of victory were most confident. So snuff is essentially a form of tobacco that you snort that was quite popular during the era. And so I guess Napoleon might have been kind of addicted to this snortable tobacco. It also mentions that after the battle. Napoleon was essentially rejected by the French ruling party or government or whatever and of all things he decided he would get on a boat and flee to England with the hopes that England would just allow him to have a quiet little cottage in the country and just mind his own business after more than a decade of tearing Europe to pieces. <laughs> But from the people on the boat that Napoleon was on, it says, It was believed that Bonaparte had in his possession a large quantity of laudanum. Laudanum being opium or morphine. So, yeah, who knows, he might have been addicted to tobacco and to morphine as well. Despite the fact that I view men like this as tyrants and responsible for so many millions of deaths, I am curious about what makes a person achieve such an astonishing level of power and I do actually have four volumes of the memoirs of Napoleon Bonaparte that one of my brothers bought for me that certainly makes me curious to dive into these at some point. I'm also curious now about the Battle of Waterloo as a whole. Having read this book I've got all of these individual 
tiny little snapshots of parts of the battle and various things that were happening. But what I don't have is a broad overview of the events that happened throughout the day to achieve the results that eventually happened. So for that, I do have another book on my shelf though called Waterloo Day of Battle by David Horvath that would give a good description, I assume, of the Battle of Waterloo and the events from a grand strategic scale rather than an individual soldier's perspective. So I might dive into that at some point in the near future and just read up a little bit more on the battle itself. But to close, there is this excellent quote that I thought was fitting. This is from a major in the British Army, and he says, after the f battle, he says, I returned as speedily as possible to Brussels with Cowper's lines in my head, quote, war is a game which, were their subjects wise, kings should not play at. It sounds about true, that if the participants knew what war was really like, the rulers would never convince them to go to war on their behalf. So felt like that was a fitting conclusion to all of this horror of humans cutting up other humans and blasting them to pieces. It is horrific and it's also fascinating. So are you into history at all? Are there any particular eras of history that fascinate you? If so, let me know in the comments. I'm definitely always looking for more historical eras and events to read about, so any recommendations you have would be appreciated. The preceding video has been brought to you free of charge by me, Josh. The only thing I ask in return is that you could do one of the following. Give me a thumb up, push the subscribe button, or share the link to this video with somebody who you think would enjoy it. Cheers. I have other books on my hist... Napoleon Bonaparte, a man who historical... Th the Na Napoleon... Those are... Here is, here's one off, here's one British officer's, here's one British officer's account, not, those worst ways, now leaving aside the liquor, now leaving aside the, thank you so much to my patron, in an, the Charlotte Eat, Napoleon eventually made himself, Napoleon, when Napoleon was essentially rejected by the French ruling, this is from a Brit uh, king. A British soldier describes this situation. He says, another British soldier describes a British just scrolled.